Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Remember when uh, David himself was given the alternatives and options? Will you have men to bring judgment, or will you receive what I will give? God forbid that I should fall into the hands of men. Whatever you say, I'll take that. Why? Because you're the God of mercy. That's what you are in yourself. And your steadfast love, the Hebrew word is chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D. Don't we sing that? Um, Every morning, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. You know why they're there every morning? Because He's there. And uh, His mercy is there. It's His tender, hot kindness is there every morning. That's what He is. And that's what David is appealing to. Save me from men. I'll take your judgment, Lord. I, I tremble to think what the world would be, or what the church would be, what Israel would be, were it not for those mercies now. However horrendous the things that are breaking upon Jewish heads in Israel and will soon afflict them everywhere in the world. Can you picture for a moment what this world would be and this life would be if God would lift his mercy up? In our marriages or our fellowships or our own lives personally, how much are we enjoying the mercies that are new every morning without an appropriate awareness and an acknowledgement of that. Worship springs out of gratitude. Whether we take it for granted, or we think that we're getting along because of our superiority, and don't give to God His due. Lord, if it were not for Your mercy, I couldn't put one foot before the other. How do we commence a Sunday morning service? Or an, an, an examination of this text, except by Your mercy. We live by your mercies, Lord. And were you to remove them, we would be obliterated. We're as dead men. We don't know how to come in or how to go out. Your mercy, Lord, is a continual grace. And we have not had stopped to think and to acknowledge and to express gratitude. We've taken you for granted. As if we have it coming. But mercy means... A grace from God, not based on anyone's qualification or merit, but based on what he is in himself. And that's what will save Israel in the end. His mercy will be extended. They will receive mercy. They will obtain mercy when you extend mercy. But will you have it to extend if you have not yourself been the recipient? How will you extend what you yourself have not received or have received it without a conscious awareness that it's the mercy of God? That's what enables you to extend mercy because you're conscious that you have have received it. Like that woman who came with the alabaster box and broke it and suffered the indignation of Jesus' own disciples pouring out that lavish ointment upon his head or wiping his feet with her hair and they were horrified To what purpose is this waste? They could not understand the lavish conduct of this woman, pouring out a year's income in a moment of uh, of tribute and acknowledgement of of this Jesus, because she was grateful, because she knew herself to be a sinner, because she knew that she was had been immoral and debased, but God had accepted her and freed her from sin. Well, you have to be a a prostitute to know that. It's really remarkable, as sensitive and as spiritual as David was as king and as the sweet singer of Israel, he himself had no acknowledgement of his sin until it was brought to him by the prophet. He could live for a year with the uh, taking another man's wife and seem to that man's execution, and somehow not be convicted by the act itself until it was brought to him through the word. What, what, what do you make of that? That the very word of judgment came as a mercy, he cracked and broke. 
just to give you a little glimpse of uh, this orthodox insight, in verses, uh, verse 13, of verse 14, will cast me not away from your presence and, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and with a generous spirit sustain me. The commentator takes the word salvation and shows that in Hebrew it is Yeshua Chor that can mean also in Hebrew your victory and that uh, it, it inclines the commentator to think that the root of David's sin was the pride of victory from military accomplishment. And because he was suffused with pride for his military victories, he was therefore a candidate in pride to conceive of the adultery with uh, Bathsheba and the murder of a husband that followed. Isn't that interesting insight? I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but I just wanted to show that there's something in the Hebrew language itself that those who are intimate with it can draw out meanings and implications that would be lost to us by the crude translation in the English. So let, let me read this. The opening verse of the chapter describes David's victory over Ammon, which it would seem should have been included in the preceding chapter. Why is it carried over into chapter 51? Because this juxtaposition serves to teach that David's pride concerning his military triumph encouraged his evil inclination to sin. Interesting observation I thought. One that ought to give us caution that we're most susceptible to sin out of a pride of arrogance that comes from accomplishment. And maybe that's why it is that the most scandalous sin of recent Christian history has come from the greatest of the televangelists who are riding high. And, and were so um, uh, greatly used of God that they would not even receive the disciplines that men seek to, br to bring them. Uh, Jimmy Swaggart would not allow himself to even cease from ministry for three months because after all, look how the world was so being blessed by his evangelistic ministry. So I wonder if he could have been saved if someone would have briefed him, you know, what was the root of David's sin? It was a pride in his accomplishment. And that pride blinded him and made him a candidate for the greater fall. You need to be careful that when you're riding high and God seems to be honoring and blessing you greatly, that your, great, that your danger is all the greater. Because the word for, for salvation in that verse can also be understood in Hebrew as victory. Now, don't, if you guys think I'm Judaizing you, uh, put that suspicion away. I'm only trying to indicate there are depths and riches that ought to be available to us if we will break through the historic barrier that has separated the church from our Jewish kinsmen and that we might avail ourselves of some of the depth and riches of their insight as well as for that very reason they might avail themselves of something of the depth and the riches of our salvation. But historically there has been a great divide in the schism. You know how we look upon these Jews? They're under the law. Well, of course they're under the law, but uh, that's the bluntest, cruelest, dullest way to understand the truth of their condition. You know? So what we, instead of, are you saved, brother? <coughs> we need to approach them in a way more appropriate to their history, their tradition, they're laboring over that word, uh, the insights passed on from rabbi to rabbi that have come in, in their collection through the sages and give us a, a, a key and a clue to things that will otherwise be lost to us. So is God being lenient, taking it easy on David because he's beloved? Or is there some other way to understand why he did not suffer the consequence of his sin? The wages of sin is death. How is it that David was spared that? and allowed not only for his life to continue, but his kingship to continue, is, is a remarkable question, not about David, but about God. What would you say of God sparing Israel? 2,000 years after the crucifixion of the Son of God, the nation still remains and has suffered greatly, but it has not been extinguished. Have they suffered the judgment appropriate to their sin? What we really should be saying, have we suffered? Are we, we're in identification with them. 
God has withheld a total judgment and maybe it takes 2,000 years to sink in. Maybe there needed to be an interval between the performance of the sin, the act, and the recognition of it. And God is allowing that span because he wants something registered on David's deepest heart because the orthodox commentators say he's not just a man, he's the king of Israel. He's a statement before his own nation of the righteousness of God. And therefore his acts and his sins have implication for all the nation that needs to be uh, fully understood and fully expressed. And for that reason God gave him uh, uh, a, an allowance of time that when, it was, that when the conviction came it would break upon his heart with a greater depth. If he had been instantly judged, all of that would have been lost. We would not have Psalm 51. How precious is Psalm 51 for the instruction of the church and of all mankind that God would say, in view of the mercy that I want to express to all future generations, I'm allowing you to be spared the instant judgment that would otherwise be your due. But it's not because of your virtue. It's my mercy yes. and my love for unborn generations that will profit from this psalm in a way that no other text has ever more deeply revealed the nature of sin, the nature of repentance, the nature of atonement. Think of um, the significance of judgments deferred where God does not bring an immediate awareness nor the judgment for the sin but allows it to be projected in, over a period of time. Think of the repentance that is yet Israel's future experience when we shall see him whom we have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for one's only son and be in bitterness as for one's firstborn so that the house of David, the house of Nathan uh, have to repent apart and husbands and wives repenting apart. Why is that? Because the depth of the strickenness of the soul of that people when we shall see him bearing the wounds that we have inflicted, whom we have blasphemed, the, the Orthodox Jew, uh, Jewries have a special name for Jesus. Uh, there's a way in which Yeshua can be turned into Yesha, which is an uh, uh, a insult, like a, a blasphemy. And to imagine that they will remember that that was on their lips, and that what they had been told them they had not heard, and are required now to see, the depth of Israel's breaking will be unparalleled in the history of the world. There never was and never will be again a depth of such strickenness as Jews will exhibit in the day that they shall see him whom we have pierced. Why? Because their sin has been so long deferred. Because God calls not only for the recognition of their own sin, but the sins of their fathers, and that the judgments which have come have been altogether just. All of that will come upon them in one fell swoop. In set, talk about your bones being crushed. They'll be as good as death. They'll have to be resurrected from the death of that repentance because it has been so long deferred and waiting acknowledgement. If that's true, what's the implication for us when the scripture says, judge yourself that you be not judged? Take care of it right now. Don't, don't let it languish for a day. If you're conscious of something and you're continually seeking the Lord for the revelation, the moment that it, it, it is clear to you, come to a place of repentance. Uh, take care of it with the Lord. Don't let it languish. It's, not, it, it's prickly and uncomfortable and you're embarrassed, but how much more mortifying when the Lord will bring it to you in full, all the more because you allowed it to languish over a lengthy period of time. It's a mercy that we have an availability to judge ourselves now that we be not judged. Is it an exaggeration to say that true repentance is dying? It is a death. It's a mortification of the soul. You're as good as dead. You, you go down and stretch that on your face. It's a posture of death. And maybe for the want of that death, our repentance has been a simile. It's a... Uh, an equivalent of a much lighter kind that really has not brought the depth of the restoration that this kind of prostrate repentance alone can bring. We're shallow in our understanding and we're shallow in our repentance and we're shallow therefore in our life.
you appreciate all the more the New Testament injunction to walk in the light as he is in the light uh, and the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin and we might have a fellowship one with another so the injunction of the Lord is be in the light continually be in the light don't allow something to be concealed and to be deferred for a length of time that will be horrific when the outworking and consequence of that comes so we ought to be jealous to stay constantly in that light not only for our acts, the thought and disposition of our hearts. I want to say that again. A lot of us who are keeping our noses clean externally are capable of, and are frequently, if not daily, in thoughts and inward words of judgment and uh, condemnation of other believers and superior evaluations and other kinds of things that we think that we're allowed because we're not performing it as an act. It's in the inward parts and in the heart that God wants his purity. And if we, if we find ourselves lapsing, I, I think the greatest sport of the church is roasting its ministers. And the greatest opportunity for self-exaltation is to finger and to find a point of defect and weakness in men who are in public places so that you who are not public can exalt yourself. Well, I saw about art what no one else has seen so, well, great for you. Uh, instead of praying uh, with pleadings before the Lord for the, the, the meeting of that, the resolution of that condition, you find yourself exalting over it and enjoying it, and even secretly desiring to see the man brought down. Yeah. One of the greatest shocks to me in ministering in Slavic nations is the enjoyment they take in fallen ministers. In Yugoslavia, I was astonished when a woman repeated a dream that she had of a certain minister that he had had an adulterous affair 20 years ago. No evidence, a dream. And on the basis of her uh, unsupported allegation, the man was removed from his office. He was the vice president of an entire Pentecostal movement. And I sensed a malicious delight in, in these uh, Yugoslavian Slavic believers in watching his downfall. That's sinful. That's a sinful heart, sinful thought, sinful disposition. Self-exaltation is a sin. And there are many of us who engage ourselves in it and think we can do it because it's not external, it's not outward, it's not visible, it's not being performed as act. But he wants truth in the inward parts, purity of the heart. Walk in the light, the light of God that's got to come into the inward man and be saved from the horrific judgment that will come in the day of the Lord when we will see as we are seen. And I'm, I'm, I'm condemning myself out of my own mouth. Don't think that I'm speaking any of these things from any superior vantage point as one who has arrived. I'm speaking it out of the depths of the greatest need that it equals or exceeds your own. But we can ask however great the depth of repentance for uh, great sinfulness, is that a guarantee that we will be immune and impervious to future sin? Yes. And if David himself, after all this, and the great sweep of this psalm, is capable again of transgression against the Lord, what is the lesson and the statement for us? You, you always need to keep short account and always know that except for the grace of God and Lord, I would fall, and, and my past fallings are no assurance that I would be preserved from the future one. I have to say that I'm indebted to the Orthodox commentary to remind me, or perhaps instruct me, that as I had never known, burnt offerings will never expiate intentional sin. All of the offerings and sacrifices of God are for the inadvertent and unknown sins. But there is no sacrifice for willing, known, conscious, perpetrated sin. And that's why he says, burnt offerings you would not, because it doesn't meet the condition. My sin was willful and conscious, and the only thing that you'll receive in sin of that depth is a broken and a contrite heart. I myself will be the sacrifice. It's not some superficial overlay. I myself am... And I'm cut up, I'm broken, my bones are smashed, I'm, and that which I, I trust you'll find acceptable. Now, 
what a more profound understanding if you understood the sacrifices and that they serve only for known sin and that there was no provision for David but the mercy of God that would blot it out. So it heightens God as God, it heightens the enormity of sin, but we, it would have been lost to us if we were not instructed out of the history of Israel and out of the Levitical prescriptions for sin through offerings. See what I mean? That greater depth of insight came through that. The deceitfulness of sin is the deceit that prevents the recognition of sin as sin. Sin does not reveal itself as sin. It reveals itself as self-justification. I have it coming. Uh, my wife is loveless. Uh, I need uh, a greater sense of, uh, of womanly support and acknowledgement. But whatever it is, sin by its very nature is deceitful. And its greatest deceit is to conceal itself as sin. And the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? And who knows, but we're not told, how David justified to himself his acts. How did he rationalize them? How, how did he find a way to say that I had this coming, or I deserve it, or uh, this Uriah was not a top-notch soldier anyway, and this woman I would deserve it? I don't know how or what. But if a, if a man of this kind, the very king of Israel, the anointed of God and the beloved of God, can give evidence of the wickedness of the heart, the deceitfulness of the heart, the desperate deceitfulness, what shall it say to us? And this is the contrition and the sense of brokenness that ought to be the character of the church itself. We are sinners saved and being saved by God. And our, our phony atmosphere and religious environment is the unwillingness to recognize ourselves as sinners. And one of the greatest books that speaks to this openly and profoundly is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, in which he says, true fellowship is the coming together of saints who recognize themselves as sinners and therefore do not exalt themselves over another, can confess the faults one to another, and the whole atmosphere is different when you see yourself as a sinner, saved and being saved by God. Your attitude to your brethren is altogether different. Hallelujah and not at all demanding or superior because you, like them, are a sinner being saved by grace. That atmosphere is lacking in our church. That's yeah. right. So that when David is confronted by Nathan, there's not a moment's hedging or hesitation or self-justification or self-defense. I am that man. Yeah. Broken, immediate recognition and no excuse of the kind that Saul gave. When did I see that? that, 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 that? I, I had say, sac slain the, 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 but I just saved a few of the best of the sheep and the oxen for your sake, to be a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And it says that Samuel wept all the night. He was grieved in his spirit at what this king was exhibiting in self-justification because the king is the model and the statement before the entire nation. And as the priest, so also the people, what shall we say if the king, so also the people? And so the prophet wept. Our problem is we're not weeping, we're not stricken, and that there's a laxity and a casualness about our whole Christian environment that... that makes these Orthodox Jews to recoil at, at what they see of our televangelists and our uh, things that we exhibit and of course leaves the world without witness also. What shall we say of David? Was he an unsaved man who did not know God, who says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me? Was it, were his psalms coined out of his own humanity or the presence of the Spirit of God in him? When he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation, was it a salvation in fact that he had known? And sinned as one saved and one and having the Holy Spirit? There's the text itself indicates that a man who has come to that salvation knows God by his presence. Let not thy presence depart from me. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. It is a remarkable evidence of what we would call salvation. It's a pre christ but in anticipation, in faith, of the Christ to come, who would be the fulfillment and the once and for all uh, statement of sacrifice, David looked to the sacrifices in anticipation of that one. He had a messianic expectation. He was saved by what he 
anticipated by faith, but he gives every evidence of a saved man. You don't use language like this. Let not thy presence depart from me, and let not thy Holy Spirit be taken from me, and restore the joy of my salvation, except that you have known that joy, except that you have enjoyed that presence, and except that you have known that Spirit. What is David if he's not the man of the Spirit? And how can he be the man of the Spirit independent of God? And yet in that condition, and with that history, and that reality, is capable of this sin. So though this, of course, could not be a reference to Jesus per se, the blotting out of my transgression is the issue of blood with which David was familiar. And the blood, so to speak, did not have to wait for its uh, being emitted at the cross, but the lamb was slain already from the foundation of the world, so that all true Davidic sons could avail themselves of that sacrifice before its actual historic fulfillment. Now that it has been historically fulfilled, we can commend it to our Jewish kinsmen who have a sin consciousness that cannot be alleviated by the kind of Yom Kippur that they practice and say to them that what David availed himself by faith is now available to you in fact. Will the church be the church apostolically until it can say with Paul, knowing the terror of God, I persuade none. We have not known that terror. We don't know that fear, and we're not persuading as we ought to persuade. Rather, our evangelism has an unknown of the good that the Lord will do for you if you call upon him. Uh, if you make this prayer, if you recite this formula, you'll receive these, these advantages. But it's not an appeal to be saved out of an eternal terror of separation from God in hell. Paul said, knowing the terror of God, I persuade men. And may we, we need to pray for the restoration of that apostolic knowledge for us if we are to be in the last days where people would otherwise perish. We have a, a, a world of so-called Christians that have been inducted into a questionable Christianity by an emphasis on the benefit that they would receive because God has a plan for their life. This will do you good. So the whole theme of our contemporary Christianity and this gospel has been an appeal to self-interest mm -hmm. and not at all predicated upon uh, the heart of what is expressed in Psalm 51. But we need to return to it as David himself was able to turn to it and say, then I will teach transgressors their sin. Mm -hmm. Then, when I've seen that, now I can really communicate. And so it's a statement for us for our present future. Yet what do we sing? Perhaps one of the most powerful um, hymnic things that have moved me, sung by the church, and not often enough, is creating me a clean heart mm -hmm. and renewing me a right spirit. So maybe we, this is inexhaustible. And among the things we may have learned today is how inexhaustible is the word of God and how its riches need to be brought out by the fellowship of the saints in the word and the environment conducive for exploring something together. Pray for the condition of the church that has lost, or perhaps never known, this um, heart of the gospel, and has uh, deteriorated with an appeal to self-interest. God has a plan for your life. Pray for the Jewish people who have a deeper apprehension of that setting, but have not the uh, appropriation. Into what shall they dip? How shall their transgressions be blotted out? Is God accepting the atonement that comes by going to a synagogue on Yom Kippur and fasting that day and doing good deeds? Is that a substitute for actual blood? And where shall that blood be obtained now that the temple is destroyed and the priesthood dispersed? The last thing that they would consider is that that criminal who was executed outside the city is that answer. And that's our message of which Paul said, I'm not ashamed. For it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first also to the Greek. Let's sing and let's pray. I want to repent, Lord, in behalf of the church that we have done this fight to the grace of God and trampled on the blood of God afresh and we have cheapened, my God, your salvation. We have made it an accommodation to men. We have reduced it to a little cheapy formula and there are numbers, my God, who have been seduced by that and have been robbed of an authentic depth of salvation that they might themselves be a Davidic presence in this earth. And we have by that same measure been bulls in the spiritual china shop. We have been crude and blunt, especially toward your people Israel, Lord. We have not known how to address them. We have not addressed them at all. And we would have done injury had we attempted it. 
out of our defiant and arrogant attitude because we lacked ourselves a broken and a contrite spirit which you will not despise. So Lord, I ask your forgiveness. I've been guilty as a member of that church and as a servant and even promulgating uh, these kinds of glib invitations and going along with that kind of flow. So contrary, Lord, to the to, to what you have put before us today. Forgive the church, Lord. Forgive your servants in the church. Give us a day of new beginnings, my God, that we can say with David, then will I teach sinners their ways. Then will I convert sinners unto you, Lord. Let there be such conversions, my God, before this age ends, before your judgments fall, not only among the Gentiles, but among your people, Israel. Come, my God, help us with a little help. Give us a day of new beginnings, we pray. And we thank you for speaking to us as you have in Yeshua's holy name.